Hello, I'm Hartmut. I'm the founder and lead of the Quantum AI team here at Google. I'm thrilled to talk to you today because I get a chance to talk about the applications of quantum computing and what our team is doing to build the world's first useful one in the next decade. I've always been interested in how the human brain works, what constitutes intelligence, and my secret passion is tackling the difficult question of what brings about conscious experience. I'm a computer scientist, neuroscientist, and physicist who spent years building AI systems at Google that see, hear, and understand the world analogous to the way humans do. Here you can see a few examples of what I've worked on during the years. Autonomous mobile robots, object and face recognition, my startups launched the first visual search engine for mobile phones and also the first face filters. I'm sure many of you have used such applications uh, today. Adversarial images, which gave rise to psychedelic deep dream art, were also invented in my team. Today, the state of AI is such that technical systems already outperform humans in many specialized disciplines, such as playing Go or translating languages. But as far as we can tell today, AI is working on principles that are different from those governing the human brain. And we start to appreciate that there are many pathways to realizing intelligence and mammalian brains are only but one blueprint. On the other hand, biological systems often still outstrip what technical implementations can do. We also have no handle on essential experiential features of human intelligence. For example, do I have a free choice when selecting an action? Why do certain sensations feel good and others bad? To make progress with such questions, it is important to appreciate that all information processing has to be realized by physical processes. And it's ultimately the laws of physics that limit what information processing can or cannot do. But all information processing done in AI today is based on the centuries-old physics of Newton or Maxwell. So it's an intriguing question. What kind of AI could come about if we were to base it on a computational substrate governed by the most current theory of the world we have today, which is quantum physics. Quantum computers will give us this chance. They replace the language of zeros and ones, Boolean logic, by the laws of quantum mechanics. This gives us access to a richer set of operations. The richer set of operations allows us to write much more powerful algorithms that can solve certain difficult problems with fewer steps, sometimes exponentially fewer steps. So we move from AI inspired by the brain to AI inspired by the intelligence residing at more fundamental levels of nature. As a friend of mine likes to say, we go from brain AI to mind AI. The dawn of classical computing spurred a Cumbrian explosion of algorithms and applications that led to tremendous discovery. Our mission at Google is to build the world's first useful quantum computer that will hopefully have an even greater impact. I would like to talk about two types of applications where we think quantum computers will be useful in the coming decades and the experiments we are running on our quantum processors today. Let's start with quantum machine learning. You may know there are two basic ingredients for any machine learning model that we use today. One is data sets, ideally large data sets for training. And second, a learner such as a neural network whose mapping from input to output gets modified during training. All machine learning today, in fact, all that science has ever done until today is to start with a set of training examples that we quantum computing people call classical. Let me explain. Take a quintessential scientific instrument, say a telescope. We capture the stream of photons that are bundled by it in either hand-drawn images or a photographic plate or a CCD camera. And then 
we draw conclusions from it. For instance, we see a comet at different times, at different positions in the night sky, and we calculate its trajectory. But in collaboration with scientists from Caltech, we have made an amazing discovery. If instead of capturing the photons with a classical device like a camera, we allow the photons to modify a quantum state, which is subsequently processed by a quantum computer, then we can learn certain properties of the system we are observing with exponentially fewer training examples. And so it's probably not an overstatement to say that this is a sea change in science. Essentially, we realize that classical machinery is blind to many features of the universe. But quantum resources will give quantum AI new sensibilities and enable quantum AI systems to draw insights about our physical world that are simply out of reach using classical machinery alone. Telescopes may turn into dark matter detectors, magnetometers may predict heart conditions or learn properties of your brain that your doctor may not have learned about otherwise. We may even build artificial noses that can smell viruses in the air. Wouldn't that be useful? By using our Sycamore quantum processor, we have already performed proof of principle experiments to show that this indeed works. If you're interested in the details, please look at the paper on the archive we show here. Now I would like to talk about another promising application for quantum computers, which is quantum simulation. We often refer to this as Feynman's killer app because Richard Feynman, the Nobel Prize winning physicist, noticed this possibility first. Quantum simulation uses a quantum computer to simulate a system in which quantum effects play an important role. Obviously, this is something we expect quantum computers to be good at. Let's apply this to one of humanity's most urgent and challenging problems we need to solve, climate change. A large contributing factor to climate change is how we manage energy. The production, transportation and storage of energy today causes a lot of CO2 to be omitted. Now, when I prepared this presentation and I looked for illustrations, I found this photo which shows a coal fired power plant near Aachen, my hometown in Germany. And I remember when I was a small boy, maybe five, six years old, I drove by this power plant. And if today, half a century later, you would do the same, the power plant still looks pretty much the same. And I can only imagine how much CO2 it has spewed into the air. But by studying nature, we can find more elegant processes to power civilization without CO2 emissions. To reduce these insights into practical engineering, quantum simulation would be an incredible tool. One example of nature's efficiency is the energy transfer in photosynthesis. It involves a complex interaction between light and proteins in a plant. Once a plant captures the energy packets deposited by sunlight, nature has figured out how to guide these energy packets to a reaction center where the fuel for the cell will be made with near perfect efficiency. Quantum simulation could help us mimicking these processes and then in turn we can use these insights to replicate this process and design more efficient solar cells or create carbon neutral fuels directly from sunlight. Another example of nature's efficient ways is how the sun produces energy through nuclear fusion. Nuclear fusion releases energy when two atomic nuclei merge. This is an attractive method for energy generation since the amount of radioactivity released is much smaller than for fission reactors, those we have today. There's also no possibility for a catastrophic chain reaction. A method to achieve fusion that I find particularly elegant is inertial confinement fusion. 
Here one shoots a strong laser pulse at a fuel pellet to smush its nuclei together. Modeling this process involves a lot of complicated physics in extreme regimes. And again, a quantum processor would be an invaluable tool to design such reactors faster. Success here means nothing less than a source of clean, near limitless energy. So I gave you two examples around energy production, but energy transport or energy storage are also opportunities for quantum simulation. For example, the task to design batteries that can hold a larger charge, that can charge faster, that are lighter and safer. To build such batteries, a quantum processor again would be an incredible tool. So wouldn't it be great if the next time we go to vacation, we could use an electric jet. We're also trying to have fun with our quantum processors and simulate very exotic states of matter, such as time crystals. Time crystal sounds intriguing, doesn't it? In short, what it is, normal crystals are periodic patterns in space made up of atoms. A time crystal is similar, but instead of forming a periodic pattern in space, it forms a periodic pattern in time. It's the closest the laws of physics will let you go to a perpetual motion machine. In one of our recent publications, we used our sycamore processors to simulate and observe periodic patterns of stable time crystals. Of course, nobody really knows what the most attractive applications for quantum processors will be. But like how classical computers transform society over time with each new advancement, so will quantum computers. And if you work in our field today, you sense the same Cambrian explosion happening Novel, very powerful algorithms get discovered and published every few weeks. And two historical notes may remind us how hard it is to predict applications of a fundamental technology in its early days. When Michael Faraday was asked, what is the use of electricity? He answered mildly annoyed, what's the use of a newborn baby? And when asked, what is computing good for? Alan Turing replied, code cracking, maybe. This sounds very much like where we are with quantum computing. And with this, I would like to hand it over to Eric, who will talk about how we are going about building a quantum computer. Thanks, Hartmut. Hi, everyone. I'm Eric, and I'm a quantum mechanic. I engineer quantum systems from the campus scale to the qubit scale. Today, I'm excited to show you our laboratory, how we build quantum computers, and give you a flavor of how we control them. Now, the systems that you're going to see today are the prototypes of the fault-tolerant, error-corrected quantum computers of the future. These systems are built by a merry band of quantum mechanics. And it's my honor to share the work of our team with you all today. Our journey together starts in Santa Barbara at the Quantum AI campus. I'd like to welcome you all to take a step inside. But before we do, I need to explain what happens when we cross this threshold. We're going to be stepping inside the quantum AI lab onto the research floor, where billions of quantum operations are ongoing today on our Sycamore quantum computers. In a quantum computation, superpositions are prepared and many worlds are explored. Are you all ready? Welcome to the other side. Wait a minute. It looks like we took a trajectory that landed us sometime in 2019. We're on the quantum AI lab research floor, and it looks like there are a lot of experiments going on all at once. I'm not sure if there's billions, but are you seeing this? We're observing multiple timelines, essentially a new experiment day by day over what seems to be many years, but it's all in one solar day. And the system seems to be heading towards a solution. Yeah, yeah. It's actually a coherent quantum AI lab. That's a relief. We don't have to repeat the last two years. You know, if you can see here in the center of the frame here, the focal point of the space is the lab, framed by a nice fishbowl of glass that shows 
you know, basically the ability for folks to always be near the hardware, which is the touchstone of our mission. And our vision was to create a dynamic research lab where we can invent the future of computing. Now this is important. Just as in quantum mechanics, where the observer is part of the experiment, we believe that our space affects us just as we design and build within it. It is this creative process, like our Quantum AI Artists in Residence program, that brings together a multitude of talents, architects, engineers, scientists, and artists who can continue to inspire our laboratory and our mission. This is our research floor. This is where we design, build, and operate our quantum computers. Our quantum computers are custom hardware. They're composed of classical and quantum hardware working in concert. These quantum systems help us learn to speak the language of nature. Each new quantum computer that we build provides a new horizon that unlocks more of the universe. For each system we commission, we finish it by wrapping it with an original piece of art inspired by a UNESCO World Heritage Site from around the world. It's more than putting art on quantum computers. It's about playing homage to the places that we hope these machines will help us protect. And now I'd like to show you how we build quantum computers. Building a quantum computer takes a band of quantum mechanics. It requires thermal engineers, cryogenic technicians, RF engineers, mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, materials research scientists, software engineers, program managers, product managers. I mean, the list goes on and on. My point is that the workforce for quantum computing extends well beyond the academic boundaries of quantum physicists. It reaches into adjacent hard tech industries that we hope our mission inspires folks to consider joining our field. We have a lot of quantum computers to build. This is a quantum computer. I'm removing some of the cans here to show you everything that's inside of the system. And the sculpture in the center of the frame that looks like a layer cake or a chandelier with all the shiny metal, that's a refrigerator. We use these refrigerators to provide a zen environment for our qubits, a dark, cold, and quiet space to protect them from distractions. The Sycamore quantum computer comprises some 10,000 components designed and assembled by our team. Each component has been chosen for its specific function, including the selection of very particular metals like niobium titanium for its superconducting properties. The system is fully wired with coaxial cables, similar to the cables that connect your home to the internet. These cables connect our custom control electronics to the quantum processor inside the refrigerator. Now there are seven subsystems to the Sycamore quantum computer, six of which are classical hardware systems deployed in what some might classify extreme temperature environments. I mean, inside of the refrigerator, it's colder than outer space. And here we have our control electronics. Inside the dilution refrigerator are thousands of coaxial cables thermalized at lower and lower temperature stages until arriving at the lowest temperature stage at the bottom of the refrigerator where we mount the quantum processor. Inside the dilution refrigerator are thousands of coaxial cables thermalized at lower and lower temperature stages until arriving at the lowest temperature stage at the bottom of the refrigerator where we mount the quantum processor. The package for the quantum processor is like the motherboard. It's a printed circuit board with a heat sink that connects to the refrigerator. And it's important that the quantum processor stays cold. And finally, we have the Sycamore quantum processor, the quantum element in the system. The chip itself can fit in the palm of your hand. It marries two pieces of silicon, one highly coherent, full of qubits, and the other like a router for the input and output. Allow me to illustrate. At the top of this image is a completed quantum processor. Beneath it, I've Oreoed the two pieces apart, showing you the control layer and the qubit layer at the bottom. The Oreo filling is actually indium, a soft superconducting metal that connects the two pieces, providing a robust mechanical and electrical connection. Now, we're going to zoom in to where these qubits are here at the bottom. Qubits in the real world are any quantum two-level system. You can take what Mother Nature provides and use an electron, which has two states, spin up and spin down. Or you could select some specific type of atom. At Google, we fabricate atoms with two levels. These artificial atoms are superconducting electrical circuits. We make them like computer chips. And our qubits are relatively large, which makes them easier to connect to and easier to control. Now I'd like to show you how we control our qubits. Our qubits are physical things. I just showed you pictures of them. And I'd like to invite you to think of a qubit as a resonator. A resonator is like a string on a guitar 
or a key on a piano. When you strike that key, it resonates at a single frequency or tone. And now sticking with this musical metaphor, let me set the stage for qubit control. The Google Quantum AI team is the band, the quantum mechanics. Our instruments are the control electronics. Lots of synthesizers are on stage. And our qubits are the dancers on the dance floor. When the band plays instruments to create music that resonates with our qubits, the qubits perform operations. They dance. Imagine a sea of qubits in a 2D grid on resonance with this music. When the band is off key or out of tune or off resonance, the qubits do not respond. They remain idle on the dance floor. Now our control electronics really send analog pulses to our qubits. When the pulses are on resonance with the qubits, they exchange energy and the qubits perform operations or quantum gates. And by arranging these quantum gates in a sequence in time, we program our quantum computer. Programming the sequence of gates is like composing music or writing a song. These compositions are the algorithms that perform calculations. Now back in 2019, we composed a song that was a sequence of thousands of random quantum gates and ran it on our Sycamore quantum computer. Scientifically, this was a hit. It was like our breakout album, and you may have heard of it. Now, if we were to convert the gate sequence to audible frequencies, it would sound like noise, I mean, experimental noise, but I know that's a, you know, a genre of music that vibes with some folks. Now, if you will allow me one more song in this musical metaphor, error correction. Quantum error correction is the ongoing opus for the Google Quantum AI team. Why do we need error correction? Well, as I mentioned before, qubits are really fragile. Physical qubits are prone to a lot of errors, and any interaction with the environment will destroy the quantum information they're holding, whether it's from stray magnetic fields in the lab or even cosmic rays from outer space. Remember that Zen environment that we created for our qubits that help remove all the unwanted interactions. The thousands of gates that we played to our Sycamore processor was limited to the fact that there's a finite lifetime of the system and that there was no error correction. Every time there was an error, we had to restart the calculation. So before we just start scaling up the number of qubits, we need to improve the quality and control of the physical qubits that we have today. And to be precise, we need to reduce our current error rates by a factor of 10. So good news on that front. In 2021, we demonstrated our largest error correction experiment to date. Our experiment was on a linear chain of qubits embedded in the Sycamore quantum processor. Using a one-dimensional error correction code, we show that as we increase the number of qubits, we effectively increase the coherence time of the overall system. This is a good thing. It shows we have great control of our qubits and that by adding more of them, we didn't make the system performance worse. For the linear code case, we actually made it better, 100 times better. We showed that quantum error correction works in one dimension, but not so fast for the two-dimensional case. There's still a lot of work to do there. Fortunately, we have a roadmap laying out what we need to invent to realize a fault-tolerant, error-corrected quantum computer by the end of the decade. Of course, we're all very eager to realize the applications that Hartman mentioned, but we must first reach a few major research milestones. We're here, busy showing that quantum error correction works. Our next milestone is to build a single error-corrected logical qubit. A logical qubit is a collection of a thousand physical qubits, stable enough to hold quantum information for a long period of time, basically until we switch the power off. But one error-corrected logical qubit on its own can't do useful computation. With two error-corrected logical qubits, we will cross a very important threshold. We will have created the first transistor of quantum computing. These two logical qubits form the atomic building block that then we can tile thousands of those together to create an error-corrected quantum computer. We're currently in the golden era of quantum hardware, with exciting inventions year over year, improving the quality of our physical qubits. It's exciting to think about when humanity was standing at the dawn of the classical computing era, yet to foresee the supercomputers that we can hold in our hands today. And today, we stand poised at the dawn of an error-corrected quantum computer, capable of solving some of the most challenging problems for the future selves and nature. It's been a pleasure sharing our work with you, and we welcome you to help us build the future of computing together. I'd like to invite you all to visit our website at quantumai.google for job openings to work with our team, as well as our open source tools and resources that you all can use in your explorations. And with that, I thank you, and I leave you with a view of our lab from where I stand.